I think an awful lot of people who um, enjoy punk would really like to be back in those days when they could actually see physical people hacking each other to death. <laughs> I'm John Holmstrom, and I'm the founding editor of Punk Magazine, which started in 1975. Well, I think punk rock came from rock and roll. I listened to uh, El early Elvis. It sounds like punk rock to me. And then you get to the Beatles for early Beatles. They're rock and roll. The Ramones patterned themselves after the Cavern Club Beatles. By 1974, 75, Rock and roll had turned into progressive rock. It was terrible. Everybody was playing long drum solos and long guitar solos and doing concept albums. No one was doing just old rock and roll except for revival groups. Well, rock and, and rock and rock had become <laughs> corporate. They thought at that time they knew nothing of what was going to come in the future. Oh, Chris Alowitz, the New Musical Express had some of the best writers and photographers and rock and roll at that time. Well, the NME in the 1970s was kind of a, a quite a, a, a radical music paper that combined, you know, the essence of new journalism, which was something that Tom Wolfe had coined, which basically meant writing very stylized, you know, idiosyncratic, often very long articles, with an element of satire, really. Great writers, and Chris was among the best. He's produced a lot of great books, one on The Clash. I'd studied English literature at, at university and decided I wanted to be a journalist, but realized that the music press seemed to have, offer a lot of freedom. Uh, they also seemed to travel a lot, which seemed a good idea, but you seemed to get a lot of space to write, you know, and, and you, you didn't, it, it didn't seem so as stuffy as you know, the, the, the mainstream press. This was kind of a new kickstart for the original rock, spirit of rock and roll rebellion, fast and loud, you know, fuck you. You could feel it. I knew, I really could feel it. An inkling of there's something shifting, you know, there's lots of stuff going on, you know, it's interesting. I think it was kind of a worldwide reaction to the Stooges, you know. To me, the Stooges, the New York Dolls, Alice Cooper, Brownsville Station, those are the bands that taught the early punks how to play rock and roll. To me, punk wasn't totally unexpected. I could feel there was something like punk in the air. I didn't know what it was going to be, how it would manifest itself. I thought the New York Dolls, who were kind of 73, 74, had been a kind of that. I, I felt it would be something along those lines. I thought the Dolls were fantastic, by the way. I thought it was absolutely tremendous. Towards the end of 1974, I met Richard Hell and he was in a band called Television and they started to play at CBGB's or they were playing there just on Sunday nights. So their manager Terry Ork asked me if I would work the door and ask for the two dollar admission. There were never very many people there but it was an interesting and the band was really, I really liked Television when Richard was in it. They were kind of very uh, unusual and not like anything I'd seen before. So I was very taken with them. And then little by little, the other bands came, the Ramones and the, the Dictators and Blondie, Talking Heads. They were all starting to play there and, and gaining some attention, although you know nobody had a record deal yet. Well, I think what's interesting about the birth of punk, um, which is in response to these kind of beer moth uh, acts like Zeppelin and the Stones, for example, but, but what is very interesting about it always and it's not just in the music, it's the do-it-yourself nature of it. You know, people did actually, you know, and it came out of places like, you know, Kensington Market, you know, where people had stores which were kind of, you know, slightly bohemian, set up, slightly counterculture, and there were places on, you know, on, also on, on, on the King's Road, uh, uh, Beaufort Market, where, where Acme Attractions was and where, where Bob Marley would sometimes venture down into the basement to get 
by weed from Don Letts. So it also the story goes. <laughs> and then you have the Saints from Australia. They had the single of the year in England with I'm Stranded. I think a lot of the punks went to see the, the pub rock band just because they were the bands playing in pubs and everybody went to pubs, there was no admission, you just could drink. And I think John Lydon got his, that thing where he leans on the microphone like that, he got that from Ian Dury. It's just a thing Ian always used to do. When Ian, because he was crippled, he you know was probably holding on a little bit more for dear life, but it's a cool move. I, I think John would admit he kind of might have been influenced by Ian a little bit. He probably wouldn't admit it, but that's okay. We got him. The English punk thing probably started with the Sex Pistols, who ironically began performing in November 75, just at the same time we were putting out the magazine. It was a band designed to sell the clothes they were manufacturing. They were making ripped t-shirts and uh, uh, bondage trousers and stuff, and they dressed the band. Uh, they, they got them wearing this stuff, and it was like a, an advert for what they were doing. And I think if Malcolm were around and you asked him that right now, he'd probably tell you the same thing. Many people who have worked with you yeah. don't have a lot of great things to say about you. Why, do you think? You're very charming, you're very articulate, you're very bright. You've been always in the right place at the yeah. right time. Yeah. Why don't they have charming things to well, say about or, me? Well, who do you think you are? What do you think you are? How would you describe yourself? Well, I don't know, really. That's a, kind of the hardest question anyone's ever asked me. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I, that's a difficult thing. I, 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 um, the Sex Pistols became a group thanks to Malcolm McLaren. The Pistols were put together. Um, they were kind of cherry-picked uh, by Malcolm, but brilliantly by Malcolm. I mean, you couldn't find a better combination of characters because they were actually a really good band. Malcolm had been managing the New York Dolls in New York, and he saw television who were, who were making a lot of noise at, at CBGB's with Patti Smith. They were doing kind of a, a double act uh, residency. So he, television was punk rock when they first started and he wanted to kind of use that formula and bring it back to London and start a band. He asked a few people like Sylvain Sylvain from the New York Dolls to fly to London to be part of the band. Uh, again, I was still living in Glasgow. Um, I was associated with uh, the people who owned the big venues up there, uh, they were our management company. And when bands used to come through to perform uh, at these venues, as I said, the infrastructure for the music industry was all uh, in London, not in Glasgow. So if they turned up and their amplifier was broken or the synthesizer wasn't working or they needed a, a guitar, they couldn't just phone up a rental company and rent one because there wasn't any, there were none. So as I'm walking out of this quite famous music shop in Glasgow, where I was always hanging around, um, I was stopped in the streets by this English guy uh, who turned out to be Bernie Rhodes, who went on to become the manager of The Clash. And he said, look, I need to speak to you about music. And I thought it was about, you know, you can I borrow an amp to get this gig done? And, uh, and he, he said, but my friend's around the corner sitting in a car. And I went round the corner and, uh, and his friend was Malcolm McLaren, who was the most bizarre sight I'd ever seen in early 70s, you know, mid 70s Glasgow, when uh, there's this very effeminate looking character with his curly hair and a dog collar and a mohair, black mohair jumper. And he proceeded to start telling me about uh, the bands that he used to manage, uh, you know, the New York Dolls. And he told me about um, uh, the shop that he, he ran with Vivian Westwood. And uh, that didn't mean anything to me at all, Vivian Westwood. Um, and he talked about clothes and fashion, whatever. And then about 20, 25 minutes into this conversation, he said, uh, I'm putting this band together, do you want to join the band? But he hadn't asked if I was a musician. A musician. So I kind of said, no, uh, you know, who would ask you to join a band if they didn't know what you did in the first place? But they stopped me in the streets of Glasgow not because I was any good at anything, but because I had this short haircut. I was wearing straight trousers when everyone else was in flares. I wasn't wearing stacked heel platform boots like everyone else. I looked different. I looked different enough for them to be interested in me 
possibly join me in this band. Suffice to say, they were in Glasgow because they had a, a, a car full of fairly hot equipment uh, in the boot. So I didn't join the Pistols, but I bought an amplifier. <laughs> and it really cemented, I think, when they found Johnny. Having Lydon to front the band, this snidey, sneery, whiny character, it was ideal. I would have ruined that band. You know, I'm glad I didn't pursue it or take it any further. Vivian Westwood had told Malcolm to audition this kid, John, as the singer, because he'd be perfect. And that was Sid Vicious, who was the drummer for Susie and the Banshees. But, you know, Johnny Rotten showed up and they tried him out and he lip synced to or, or sang along with uh, Alice Cooper, I'm 18, and blew him away. And I think that set the tone for the Pistols. I think what people forget a lot is that in England, the Sex Pistols, even though, of course, they only had one album in England, too, although a series of singles, because singles was still a big thing in England, where it really had pretty much died in the United States. The set, there's media there is there's three weekly music papers and you know then they hit the tabloids and this so you know there they could barely walk down the street so that was another factor when they came to America you know they were anonymous in in some ways or worse considered like freaks you know because there was no punk and not like you know Paul and Steve didn't really look like punks too much although Steve did rock the leather jacket and the cowboy hat thing but you know, they were just, like, Sid would have, was just considered a freak. You know, Gruen has those pictures of him on the bus with the mi businessmen. He's reading a comic book or Mad Magazine or something, and these businessmen are looking at him. I mean, he, you know, it was a, a creepy thing. There was nobody like that. It was worse than hippies. <laughs> you, you know, the, the Sex Pistols did suffer from some perception that they were like the monkeys that were put together by Don Kirshner and they were just puppets of Malcolm's. But um, I think there's some other examples of bands that transcend that. You know, the Pistols were not just puppets of Malcolm's. They really ended up being this phenomenal band that could produce this great punk rock. Uh, Joan Jett once said, it's very difficult to play something simple really well. Well, obviously I thought the Sex Pistols were fantastic. I thought this is a really good idea. Um, I have to say that they, their appearance on the Bill Grundy show, which is kind of trumpeted as kind of, you know, the, 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 it was due to Steve Jones, really, uh, that you know this shameful appearance. I mean, it wasn't. It was quite sort of pantomime. Like, really, it wasn't really that bad, guys. You know, it was like quite mild, really, what they did. But the pistols were obviously a fantastic idea, and I saw them first in early April, nineteen seventy-six, supporting the One O Oneers, whose singer, of course, was Joe Strummer. And um, it was a kind of, as, as the Pistols managed to make of most things, it was a kind of legendary affair, because at some point, <laughs> quite early on in the say, Vivian Westwood seems to be suddenly attacking another woman who's in some front row. And then, you know, rotten leaps down and starts hitting someone. It's, I think Steve Jones was involved with someone. And this is just, the, the gig has hardly started. I think uh, Glenn Matlock and Steve Jones were hanging out at the shop and uh, Malcolm just decided to try them out in the band. Glenn ended up writing, I think, all of the music that I think when they fired him, and I think that was 77, that was the beginning of the end for the band. How was it for Glenn and the Pistols? I think it was probably quite difficult for him. I think at the time, uh, he would have been, you know, him and, him and Paul Cook, I suppose, were the quiet ones. And, uh, and in the shadows of the other two, and certainly in the shadows of, of uh, um, uh, uh, John. Um, so um, I think he probably had a bit of a hard time. Uh, and he probably find, found the whole thing quite alien, because he's not that kind of character. It would have been kind of putting on an act, 
in a way, you know, to be the kind of the rowdy punk because he was never that kind of guy. Um, so I think he probably felt a bit like, um, like uh, you know, a, a fish out of water. Uh, although he was such a major part of it, you know, if it wasn't for him, the chord se sequence would have been different. You know, the, the riffs wouldn't have been there to the same extent. You know, it was in a way it was his pop sensibilities. Uh, you know, I remember at the time they were saying, oh, we threw him out because he liked the Beatles, you know, which is a great line, but probably not true. But he probably did like the Beatles, you know, it's not why they threw him out. It was because he did listen to all that kind of music that he had this great melodic pop sensibility. So he was a really good writer, but it became a bit of a monster where the, the media image of the, the Pistols had taken over what the music was. Then Punk Magazine came along in 1976. I met those guys, uh, John Holmstrom and Lakes McNeil, and they asked me to be the photographer for Punk Magazine. So that worked out really great because they did very creative, unusual things with the magazine. Actually, uh, I was making a living because I had gotten a job at a magazine called Bananas. Uh, R.L. Stein was the editor back then. So that paid me enough that I could devote all my time to trying to start a magazine. The magazine always lost money. You know, we struggled along for the first year. And the magazine was sort of capturing the zeitgeist whatsoever. And a lot of people were paying attention to it. And one of them was Tom Fursad, who was the publisher of High Times magazine, which was a marijuana drug magazine that had been making a lot of money. It was a little radical, but they had a lot of advertising base, I guess, for people that, you know, couldn't advertise anyplace else but in high times. Tom Forsad visited the office one day, and I was in the middle of drawing, and he, he walked up to me, took, took a chair, put his cowboy boots on my desk. So I interrupted my work and said, I'm going to make you rich and famous. And then he tried publishing the magazine, but the world was not ready for us. I think the issue we published had the worst sales of any magazine in New York history, something that bad. So he dropped us. But, um, you know, we kept going, and then after a year I decided to visit him again, and we both agreed, let's try it again. That was around October of 1977. And I think he, in the back of his mind, he was thinking about once the Sex Pistols tour was announced, he was going to find a way to incorporate us and get us to cover the Sex Pistols. He was a huge fan of the Pistols and punk rock. Um, he had been road manager for the MC5. He even named the magazine after uh, MC5 lyrics. First time we met him, he brought us back to his loft where he had the world's biggest speakers and he played kick out the jams while well, he smoked the best pot in the world. So, and he put Johnny Rotten on the cover in, I think, October 77. So everything was kind of moving. He also put Blondie on the cover and hired Francesco Scavullo to do the photo shoot. He always thought big. You know, that was a pretty consistent group of advertisers, I guess. So the magazine, which is still going, uh, was having a little problems then, I guess, with ownership. But Tom really liked Punk Magazine. Tom was a drug smuggler, so he always had money. And the High Times was making so much money. Tom Fursad was, he was international man of mystery. You know, he sort of dressed like this cowboy and had gold bars that he would throw across the room at you if he got mad, as he did at me. We found out later they weren't real, but that took 20 years to figure out, too. Tom was a revolutionary. He was a yippie, and when the yippies supported McGovern for president in 1972, he rebelled and started the Zippies. If you're going to film a film about, about that kind of thing, you better show Freddie Weintraub giving Wavy Gravy the instructions to be a groovy hippie and not have any crazy stickers on his car. Because any other time that they went across America, they have three jobs in class. I know about that, well, I'll call you on it right okay. now. What it is, is Look inside the bus, man, the hog farm more. bus. I live inside the bus. Will okay. you listen to me? Says Free Johnson Clare. Listen to me. Shut up! He was a white panther. He was a weatherman. He was everything. He also ran the underground press syndicate. 
So he was helping every radical newspaper in America. He had been arrested in 1972. Uh, he stole a presidential portrait of Lyndon Johnson from the gallery, the White House gallery, I think. And they arrested him for trying to assassinate President Nixon because he had smoke bombs in a truck he was driving. You come look for me. You know where I am. No, we're not here. Uh, there he goes. There he goes. Go to his love festival tomorrow. We'll all love each other with nine. You're our brother. You were there in Boulder, weren't you? I'm not your brother, man. I'm with him. Why? Because you shouldn't be doing this trip. We came here to play business. Look, play a you came here because you had nothing else to do. You know, like that cat's a brother, you're a brother, everybody in the world's a brother. I first uh, became aware of the DOA Rites of Passage documentary probably in the early 80s. I used to have a contact in London who used to ring me up every now and again, tell me that he'd got a new live pistols bootleg. These primarily the ones from America, like Winterland and Dallas. So I've taken them off him to like the late 70s, but I wasn't the punk anymore, but I was still interested in the pistols. So he told me about this documentary on the US tour. I bought a copy. So it comes, I put it in, I'm all excited. Uh, it's got other bands on there, like the Rich Kids, Sham 69, Generation X, Sex Ray Specs. But the pistols footage, as good as it was, was just little snippets, maybe one song, sometimes less than that from each show. And I couldn't understand this documentary on the Pistols US tour was just these little snatch grabs and there's no interviews with the band. Of course, say years later, now I know why there was only snippets. It's because Let Kowalski and his crew had to sneak in or bribe their way into the venue, get a quick song and get out again before, before they were thrown out. I worked on DOA for my sins. So when the Sex Pistols were going to come to America, Tom decided he needed to cover it. It was an important event. They were culturally significant. Okay, I went up to the office right around Christmas, or maybe, it must have been right afterwards, and I had a meeting with Tom. And when I left, I saw all these cameras and film equipment outside his office. And Maureen McFadden, Tom's assistant, said, hey, John, I'd like you to meet uh, a filmmaker, Le Kowalski. He might have even mentioned that he wanted to talk Tom into covering the Sex Pistols tour. I was like, good luck, and went back to my office. And then uh, a few days later, I got a call from Tom, and he said, hey, John, how you doing? I saw the Sex Pistols last night. They were great. And I was like, I wish I could be there. When we heard that the Sex Pistols were coming to the United States and they weren't coming to New York, we were really pissed off. I mean, we didn't have any money, so even to go to Atlanta or Memphis, that was completely out of our realm of even considering, you know, to buy an airline ticket. I was like, yeah, that's nice to hear, Tom. He's like, why don't you come down to see him tonight? Tom had, I guess, made arrangements with John to go on the tour and cover the tour but there was no mention of anybody else going. So, you know, we were all jealous, but at least one of us was going. I had to drop everything and throw a few things in a bag and take a cab to the airport. I barely made the flight. I, I, the doors were about to close. I get to the flight, go, go down to the airport, and I'm looking at the clock. I'm like, I missed the show. I'm never going to see the Sex Pistols. So I get there, and there had been a riot. Somebody was selling counterfeit tickets, and they weren't letting anyone in. Somebody from Warner Brothers, Gary Kenton, came out and said, John, what are you doing here? And I'm sitting there with my suitcase. I'm like, can you get me in? And Gary somehow got me in. And everybody's in there is screaming and yelling. They're playing an Alice Cooper record. I'm like, what's the matter? What the, Alice Cooper's great. He's like, yeah, but they've been playing it over and over again for the last four hours. So it was another 20, 30 minutes before the band came on. They went on very late because Sid had been kidnapped or disappeared or something. So I was very lucky I got to see the first show, which was very tame. But I figured, okay, I saw the pistols, I'll go home. 
Tom said to meet him at the concert venue, but he wasn't there. So I waited around, and then I just decided to hitchhike to the uh, airport to go back. And I ended up getting picked up by a couple of pimps, drug dealing pimps. And they tried to sell me drugs, and they got really mad because I didn't have any money. And I, they stopped the car, and I jumped out and ran away. I had to throw my suitcase at them, and that had my plane ticket in it. So I'm wandering around trying to avoid any car in case it's them. And miraculously, I come to a fence on a hill, and there's the airport. It was like, ah. So I, I stumbled down the hill, go into the hotel, and I run into Lech Kowalski, the film director, in the lobby of the hotel. I was like, hey, John, how you doing? And I ended up helping him film a scene with Don Snyder, the photographer, in a hotel room. And then they put me up in a hotel room. And the next morning, I tried to call the airport to get another ticket back to New York. And I get summoned to Tom's limousine. But then John started, I guess maybe he encouraged them to say, I don't have a photographer. And then they got the idea, oh, right, we should have a photographer. So I started getting these calls from, everything was like very top secret. And I was getting these calls like, you'll be on flight 49 at da 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 in the morning. And, you know, John was like, don't ask any questions. Don't ask any questions. I get summoned into a stretch limo and Tom runs down his plan for me. You know, it was all this big sort of mystery thing. And then when I finally met with John, as I said, we were sort of, it was like we were on this secret mission, which we probably just created in our minds, but that was Tom's MO. He's like, we're going to make a film about the Sex Pistols. You're gonna do the book and you're gonna do a cover story in the magazine. So I was up for that. And I actually went to see the Ramones at the Palladium. I uh, went to the after party. I had no cash. I borrowed $50 from David Johansson. Got in an airplane the next morning, first class, to San Antonio. Uh, Annie Leibowitz was sitting behind me on the plane. She said, aren't you Roberta Bailey? But she was probably completely confused how I was in first class, as confused as me, of course. It's going to be the biggest selling issue ever. And then they said, you're dressed wrong and they drove to a men's shop and put me in a polyester cow cowboy suit with uh, snakeskin boots and snakeskin belt. And he said, sex pistols were being held hostage by Warner Brothers security. They asked us to get some belts made out of bicycle chains. What am I doing now? <clears throat> that was my introduction to the tour. The first thing Tom told me was that the pistols were being held hostage by the security people yeah. and that they had talked to him and wanted to see if he could get them some weapons so they could get away from the security people. Mm -hmm. Well, what happened was in, uh, I think it was in Memphis actually, and I don't know why we were in that motel because normally you were supposed to sleep on the bus, but for some reason it was decided Sid was looking really ill because he, he'd run away from Atlanta in Atlanta and he'd scored some junk. Oh. And his hand now was all gashed. I had to go and find him. I was told by the Vietnam vets, you fucking find that guy, you get him on this fucking bus in Memphis, or we're going to kick the fucking shit out of you. We've got $25,000 on these guys and we're delivering them to San Francisco. I had to go out into Memphis and search the whole town because Sid had run away. We didn't know where Sid was, and I had to go back to the club, trace where he was last seen, and found him in a little house in Memphis, upstairs, where his hand, he, he gashed his whole arm, or someone had gashed his arm, to shoot up some junk. So I had to take him to a hospital, get his arm bound up, and get him onto a flight to meet the truck uh, or bus at Memphis. And thereafter, he would be permanently handcuffed. That was it. And everybody had to get up in this hotel, get on that fucking bus. It was like three in the morning. We didn't know what the fuck was going on, but that's what was happening. Because these Vietnam War vets were like fucking animals. They're like something out of a Hemingway novel. They'd been trained in Cuba to shoot commies or whatever. Tom was determined to make a guerrilla film. Uh, he hated Warner Brothers, and that's one of the tensions in this whole film documentary. 
Malcolm didn't care. Malcolm probably loved the idea that someone was going in, sneaking, filming the footage. Uh, probably wasn't that the idea that it was going to be a documentary that he wasn't going to receive any money for. And the director was Lech Kowalski, who I didn't know at that time. There were several other film crew members. Uh, started out on the movie as a, an assistant cameraman. I was in Atlanta and I got a call from the rental house and there was a guy that, I don't know, raised the hairs on the, uh, the, the rental guy and he said, oh, we want you to go out with the camera with this guy from New York. And so I was in Atlanta and I got a call and I went over there and I met Leck and that's it. Everything that he said is is sort of encapsulated in this interview we're doing outside the club. Oh, it was the greatest oh, thing great. I've ever it seen. It was worth all the money we paid and all the trouble we went through to get out here. <laughs> Fuck no, they're garbage, man. You know, they're garbage. In the dark, and I think I'm probably holding the sun gun, and he'd ask me, he said, well, you've shot interviews. I said, yes, lots of interviews. And, you know, he said, here, take it. And so I'm holding the sun gun, and then I'm holding the camera, and then I'm shooting the interview, and I'm doing this, and then somebody else grabbed the sun gun, and that's how I became a cameraman. You know, all I remember was how my pulse was racing when I was suddenly handed this camera, you know, in the middle of an interview. I was just happened to be there. My job, my job was I was the sound guy, um, and, you know, I had... I had a very well-rounded background in all aspects of production, camera, sound, um, you know, all, all of that. And so that was, um, that was my job. I held the boom and I did the recording and, you know, uh, sometimes we'd be doing interviews, sometimes we would be doing um, live music performance. Quite frankly, I, I never even met them on the tour. I don't remember ever seeing Lack or if I saw the crew members, I didn't really know they were working for, for Lack. I knew a little bit, um, but I was not listening to punk rock. But I heard the furor about the Sex Pistols coming, and when I, but when I heard them that night, and we filmed them at, the, at the Atlanta in the Great Southeast Music Hall, I was a fan very, very quickly. I'm going, all this noise. And people said they can't sing, they're not good, and I'm going, no, they're great. You got to hear these guys. I mean, the stage presence. I, 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 had, I had seen a lot of really good uh, rock and roll acts. I had seen the Allman Brothers probably six times before any of them died. I'd, I'd seen Hendrix at the Atlanta Pop Festival. I'd been to the Stones concert probably twice. So I, I knew rock and roll, but. I had not quite experienced this. The band on stage, they were wild, they were loud, they were outrageous, they were profane. They would wind up, they would, they would you know, try and, 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 and create this sense of, of, you know, outrage amongst the people who were watching and, 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 you know, but behind the scenes, when they were off stage, I always found them very quiet and Leck, he knew what he wanted. He knew what he was trying to do. He didn't always communicate what he was trying to do. I felt a, a strong connection right away, especially with Leg. He was very articulate about his vision of what he wanted, you know, and I would do a certain kind of lighting and he would just go, oh, no, you put the sun gun and you hit them in the face with the sun gun. And so there were certain rules, you know, how you did things. He didn't want pretty, he wanted, and then it was when I saw then when I got what he was doing, I went, oh, yeah, of course. And things he did with the camera, you know, and he would throw it out of focus and he would move it in there. And I'm like, what is he doing? It was like this, but it created this energy. And, and, and I, I absorbed that and I, I used it in my work, you know, from then on. I mean, just the idea that the camera is part of the story You've got to get into the story. You don't just sort of sit back and look at it. And that's, that's what Leck was always after, to, to get in there. 
and that, that's what he did. So it was pretty exciting for me. It, it, it happened, the learning curve was like this, and it was like, you know, we, we took off, we went to Memphis. Uh, I had one, I didn't have a change of clothes for the next, I think, 10 days, and I never went home. <laughs> it was just, you know, a lot of camera people were there from news organizations. I think that Lex crew also sort of disguised themselves as network uh, affiliates so they could get into the show and film. Warren is all about Tom's nefarious past and what he, it's the counterculture guru, and they flatly refused to allow him access to the pistols whatsoever. That's why they had to sneak in and various guys is pretending that they were press or journalists. Because Warner Brothers, who was the Sex Pistols record company, I don't think really wanted anybody to film. I, I think Malcolm probably didn't want anybody to film uh, outside of their organization. But somehow through sort of kamikaze means, I guess Lech filmed, I think, all of the shows. Well, actually, Tom did try to communicate with Malcolm. And Malcolm was friendly with Tom, from what I understand. The problem was Malcolm lost control of the band once they landed in America. And Warner Brothers and their tour manager, Noel Monk, kind of took everything over and pushed Malcolm to the side. So Warner Brothers was calling the shots. Once Tom realized this, he tried to bribe Noel Monk with an antique car and by impressing him that he's publisher of High Times. Noel Monk just thought he was a big jerk and uh, refused to, to work with him. So from then on, his, the cameras were banned from the venues. They had to sneak them in. Uh, it became espionage making this film. We tried lots, we used lots of different types of sub, subterfuge to get in and shoot. Pretty sure this is what happened. I know it happened a couple of places until it didn't work anymore, but Lech hired a limo. So we showed up in the limo, we jumped out of the limo and with our cameras and we went right in at that stage door. You look at the equipment that we were using then and compare it to, you know, to what you have now um, and it, you know, it, it was a lot of work to get, to get those things right. You're shooting on film, um, you're recording in sync uh, on, uh, on you know, magnetic tape. It's, it's pretty tricky stuff. At one point, and we had this uh, uh, woman camera assistant, and uh, she we had we outfitted her with a really big handbag, because the NPR magazines, which they were pretty big and heavy, and so she would load and and put the go out, go to the truck or the van or whatever we had, load, come back in with a handbag, switch the camera, with switch the mag with me if I was in the middle or lack. Both of us would usually be shooting. You just had to be ready to get up and go and not know where you were going to go next. Get out of here! Yeah, what are they saying? What's saying? Get out of here! There was one guy that had this tape on his face and or maybe he was hit. I mean, everything kind of blurs together. You know, we just shot constantly. We would shoot till we ran out of film and then we would load more film as fast as we could and we would shoot some more. We did not check the gate. If you could adapt to that, which we all did, you know, then it, you know, it turns out fine. I also, at one point, Tom hired a bodyguard uh, for me because I was getting, the bouncers would come in and, you know, I don't remember all the details, but I do remember a couple of bouncers closing in on me and then not being there anymore. After the concert, they came out and talked to the press for the one and only time. And after the press conference, as it was winding down, I saw the cam one of the cameramen for the film getting menaced by th the security crew. And they were going after the cameras. I think they were going to destroy the cameras. So the cameraman had to kind of back out and run away. Because we'd be right in the middle of, I'd be right in the middle of mosh pit. I was tall, so I'd hold the camera over my head and shoot, you know, and people would be like bouncing into me and stuff. But then when they finally got hold of me at this particular concert, I had no mag on the camera because all the film had gone out and they got hold and they took the camera away from me. I said, so you're stealing the camera. So what? It's not mine. Look right there. Atlanta Film Equipment Rentals is right there on the thing. I said, you're going to steal the camera. I said, I'll just call it in. Fine. Well, we want your film. I said, 
well, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no film here. You know, some of that was just the dynamic nature of the of the situation that we were in, and um, and and the story was building. It was creating, and it some of it was it was creating itself, and some of it was Leck was seeing new puzzle pieces and new elements to add as we were going along. I think that that turned out quite well. And our job was then to stake out uh, hotel locations in case the pistols showed up. They didn't. So we went to a place called the Broadway Plaza Hotel. Roberta and I went out to get dinner and we're sitting there eating and Malcolm and Steve and Paul walk in the room and Malcolm says, Roberta, what are you doing here? It's so good to see you. Roberta had worked for Malcolm in London before she moved to New York. So then Malcolm joined us after Steve and Paul were interviewed and he talked to me about the upcoming show. And I'd already heard that San Antonio was gonna be rough, that there was a very redneck crowd waiting for them. And Malcolm was like, great, more chaos. We traveled, I didn't arrive until San Antonio, which was the Randy's Rodeo show that was very chaotic and lots of beer cans being thrown. It was a little chaotic to say the least. The big sign outside um, Randy's Rodeo in this cold and, you know, and snowy night. And, and it says tonight, the Sex Pistols, um, January 31st or something like that, um, uh, Merle Haggard. San Antonio was a trip. That was the most, I'll never forget, I'll never forget that night, oh my God. The people, the crowd was loaded. Nothing really prepared me for what happened at Randy's Rodeo, which was this very chaotic show with a lot of rednecks, I don't know what they were, but they weren't Sex Pistols fans, they were more like curiosity seekers and they brought a lot of, or they drank a lot of beer and threw a lot of the cans at the band. I mean, there are pictures after the show where you can just see the whole floor is like, you know, two cans deep in, in empty cans because there had been this constant barrage of beer cans flying through the air. When they came out, the crowd started throwing stuff at them. And Johnny Rotten just stood there and looked at them. And, and I think, you know, it's, if I remember correctly, a beer can half full of beer just bounced off his head and he just kept staring at the crowd and he said, if I'm not mistaken, he said, we came here to dance, what did you guys come here for? And they went into whatever that song was and the beat and before the song was halfway through, the whole place was rocking. Rednecks, punks, everybody was dancing and bouncing up and down and pogoing and it was pretty cool. San Antonio was the wildest show I've ever seen in my life. And you can see the footage in DOA where Johnny's getting hit, hit with mashed potatoes and you know, they're throwing beer cans at the band. It was a converted bowling alley, I believe, the venue, Randy's Rodeo. And uh, it was a very rowdy crowd. That was a show also that Sid hit the gentleman over the head with his bass. Someone in the front tried to start a fight with Sid and Sid took off his guitar and swung it at the guy. He ended up hitting a Warner Brothers music executive. And then the lights went out. And you could hear the crowd grumbling. And I was really afraid there was gonna be a riot and a violent, terrible, bloody rebellion here. I just came up and upset the bass player because I knew that he knew that I meant physical harm. And I have to say, I was ugly about it. Instead, the lights came back on, the pistols went back into their music, and, and they were like challenging the, the audience to fuck with them. They were like daring them. They were throwing beer cans constantly. Sid stuck his chin out, daring them to hit him, and he took a full beer can right off his chin. That was the craziest show I have ever seen. We got in everywhere, one way or the other, but um, mostly 
what Lick had, and I mean what was necessary for, for there to be any imagery of this at all, he just wouldn't take no for an answer. And um, if he hadn't been that way, then, you know, whatever value this footage has, it just wouldn't exist because they weren't allowing it. So Baton Rouge was less eventful, but it was a very fun event. Uh, they played at a place called the Kingfisher Ballroom, and it was fairly uneventful for the show, except that at some point people in the audience started throwing money at, at the group. And uh, I think Johnny said, fuck this small change, throw dollar bills. So some of the people did. And the band stopped playing so they could pick up the money. Why people don't like me? Well, maybe I didn't pay them well enough. They were only making like $10 a day per diem. But then I, don't, I never think people really need money like that. You know, I... I What'd you uh, do with the money? Yeah, what would you do no, with the money? No, what did you do with the money? What did I do yes. with the money? Well, I spent it. <laughs> Well, on good things. But on you don't good, feel that they things. had a right to have it to spend it on things? No, they would have wasted it. You sure I, about yeah, that? Yeah, I, I, I did wonderful things with it. Yes, I was getting paid initially. Uh, uh, while Tom was on the, on the job, every morning he would peel off a $100 bill and hand it to us. Or, and, and I think that's what the going rate was for this kind of work. Was, uh, yeah, but that would have been for a day. And a 24-hour day was maybe a little bit... But I was getting paid enough when we went to England later and then Tom wasn't there and that the bills ran up and then there were issues, high, high Times was supposed to pay us out of their office but somebody in High Times would not pay the bills and uh, so I didn't get paid for the lion's share of the work but I did get paid in the start. When we were, when we were on the road um, with, the, uh, with the pistols and, and um, and going from you know these interesting venues in interesting places um, that you would you, I don't know you would not expect you would expect the Sex Pistols to play New York and and Chicago and you know of course you know Dallas or an, an Atlanta um, uh, but they weren't the places that you know uh, that that you would have expected them to play and uh, and and sometimes. Um, the local culture uh, in a place like Baton Rouge or in Memphis uh, would um, sort of there would be a little bit of a clash, a little a little bit of a scraping of hulls um, between you know the pistols, what they represented, the way they behaved, um, and uh, especially when we played in sort of country western music venues, which had n never seen anything anything like like this um, before. I think it was originally Malcolm's idea was to not play in the the big centers of the media centers. It just is a way to throw things a little askew. It never allowed you, I suppose, to package the Sex Pistols into a genre of rock and roll history. They kind of stood right out there. When you thought that they were supposed to be part of some giant myth, they weren't. They were just hooligans. I made sure of that only because I didn't want them to uh, be written down as part of um, some stepping stone. <coughs> they were marvellous when they couldn't play and terrible when they could. When could they? At the end. <laughs> Really? That's when it got. was falling off the stage. They were. They yeah. Oh, play. they were better then. Uh, yes. Well, you never saw them in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> there was theatre in this, um, on stage, but there was also theatre that was going on behind the scenes. Because the record company, and the record business had gotten very. You know, you do this, you do this showcase. You know, then you do a meet and greet. Then you do all these things. You do the radio thing. The ra well. Punk rock was not welcomed, certainly not from England and not from America either. I mean, people were afraid to interview Debbie Harry because they thought she was going to pull a switchblade. <laughs> you know, it was totally, well, it certainly looks absurd now. I mean, it seemed pretty absurd then to us because we just thought it was music. But it, it really, there was a sense of fear within the industry that it was something they didn't understand, they couldn't control. One of the English journalists on the tour confronted Noel Monk, the tour manager, 
and he was complaining that they were getting no access to the band. And Noel started threatening them, like, what are you going to do about it? And they had hired for security a bunch of biker gangs, you know, biker, uh, bikers and uh, cowboys. And they were just kind of menacing the journalists who had to back down. I mean, these are little guys. There was a lot of friction. I think afterwards, I saw some bodyguards for the pistols beating up some audience members for no apparent reason. It was a very weird, chaotic scene. Was that at all an exciting time for you, though? No, it was awful. <laughs> Starvation and uh, notoriety at the same time don't really go well together. It's, it was pretty sickening. What about the shows? What about the audiences? Candy! My name's Candy. I'm a bass player. Yeah, and a singer from a band. <laughs> LA, LA, LA's the place to be. <laughs> Nobody hurt me, just a fucking Texas patrolman took me and threw me out the door because I was hanging around. I lived in San Francisco with my roommate Vicky Schrott on Hate and Ashbury above a record store so we could make all the noise we wanted. Went to a lot of shows and we'd go through the Walgreens and open all the Dippity Doo bottles and do our hair as we were walking through there. Steal all of our dinner at the grocery store next door. You know, regular shit. I had never heard of the Sex Pistols and Helen Killer was totally in love with Sid and had a tarantula and a snake named Johnny and Sid. So that's the first I'd heard of them. Somehow it was decided to uh, drive to Dallas to see the Sex Pistols. And the Pistols were really amazed that we had driven all the way from uh, California to the Longhorn Ballroom to see them. We got to stay for sound check, and of course they gave us free passes for, the ne for that night show. Well, we're hanging out waiting to get in. This little Volkswagen drove up, and it was like a clown car. All these groupies from L.A. spilled out. So we came back at night and uh, went to the show, and uh, we were up front, of course, and decided as a collective unit that we were going to jump on stage in Anarchy in the UK. So when, when we decided to do that and tried to get up on stage, their roadies, um, there was one in particular, which I can't remember his name, but he was a complete asshole, uh, you know, was basically like... Totally strong arming, angry, you know, I'm gonna hurt you, dirty punk rocker type guy. That got pretty wild. The, the roadies were physically beating up the girls. The, these bikers were so violent. It, rock and roll shows got like that after a time. They couldn't control the crowds unless they could use violence. We got up on stage and I told him not to touch me or I'd kill him. I remember that because it was like the beginning of a very acrimonious interaction that would continue for a while with this guy. I don't know when, at what point, I hit Sid. Um, maybe it was getting up on stage then. Um, whatever, he had a bloody nose. We became fast friends. It got very rowdy. Uh... And Sid started uh, butting his head against one of the groupies who got to the front, the L.A. groupies. And he, his nose got all bloody, and he just started wiping the blood all over himself. And he had scrawled, give me a fix, on his chest. He, Sid was into self-mutilation, so... So during the show, I kept... I don't know if it was me, just me, or me and others stealing the tip jars um, at the bar. It was just a beer only bar, but there was a big fat tip jars full of money and we had no money. So um, kept stealing tip jars and stealing drinks. So got pretty wasted. And so when the place was closing down and emptying out, it was just the pistols and us punks that came from LA hanging out there. And I kept getting kicked out the front. So I was out in the front parking lot and um, I think I was laying in the dirt. I was really drunk. I remember that. Um, laying in the dirt, and somebody came up with a camera and put it in my face and said, you know, will you say something? Or, you know, and I 
basically said uh, punk rockers would like to care, but we can't. That's why we carry chains in our pockets to protect ourselves, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it was probably right before that that, that, that uh, I almost got arrested, probably for being drunk and disorderly or really drunk underage. Um, and the cameraman told the sheriff that I was with them and that, that we were filming. So whoever that cameraman was, I will always be highly indebted to you for stopping me going to jail in Dallas, Texas. These groupies came to Malcolm and they told them what was happening. And Malcolm was getting pissed off, but he was obviously helpless to stop this. The band was traveling by a bus where Bob Gruen and Joe Stevens, who are the photographers on the tour, were on the bus. But John and I started flying, and then pretty soon Malcolm and Steve and Paul started flying too. We would usually, um, if they were riding, if they were taking a bus, then we would take a, a flight, and if there wasn't a flight, you know, Tom, like he said, he got a Learjet once, and boom, we're there. And... Um, then we would shoot peripheral stuff between that and the concert. You know, I found Sid curled up asleep on the, on the floor in the hotel and uh, picked him up and helped him get into a bed and sleep. And, uh, but we would be on the same tour, but we didn't have, you know, they were, they were kept separate from us. Tom had managed to get through to certain people in the Sex Pistols road crew because coincidentally, every time we stayed at a hotel, it was the hotel the Pistols were staying in. You know, I think the, the, the crew, I think Malcolm's crew were rebelling against Warner Brothers and helping Tom make the movie just to screw with Warner Brothers who were treating them terribly. So we hung out a little with them. I, I really liked Steve and Paul. They were very down-to-earth, working-class uh, guys, and I thought they were really good players as well. You know, they weren't like these incompetent, uh, one-off people that people imagine for punk rock. Sid was another story. He was a very well-versed musician, and I think that was frustrating for the other band members. and for everybody in general, but Sid also got a lot of attention. He was very tall, he was very dramatic on stage. He was charismatic, and uh, he had this sort of strange reputation of violence and viciousness. So he attracted a lot of attention. Uh, I've read that that sort of bothered John Lydon, who was Sid's friend from before the band, but John sort of had a little bit of the attention taken off of him with Sid being in the band. That might have caused some conflict. My take on Sid was um, I was very sad for him because I looked at him as just a, a young kid who had never been anywhere and um, he's thrust in the spotlight in a foreign country and he just is like a deer in the headlights and just, you know, and, and with Nancy's influence back in England, he was totally fucking strung out and now in retrospect I see that um, that's what that awful roadie's job was, was to keep him away from drugs. They were kind of regular guys, and Sid, you know, you could talk with Sid. Johnny, Johnny kept to himself. Whether he was method acting or, but the persona that he was in, he stayed in it. So I don't, I don't think I ever had a conversation with Johnny Rodden personally. You know, with Sid, yeah, I, I had exchanged some words. And Tom was there. I, I saw him. He paid. I don't know how many days he was on the tour, but he was there quite a few because I did have a few quite a few hundred dollar bills which he gave gave me in the morning so we're waiting to take transportation to the hotel tom got on a pay phone and called the high times office and he was on the phone for like 20 minutes to a half an hour and he's getting progressively angrier and angrier he's turning beet red and at the end he's like slamming the phone like in frustration and he, he's like, get in, the, you know, get in the limo. He ordered like stretch limos for everybody. He'd been in a great mood up until this point. But this is a turning point. From here on, he was mostly in a very bad mood. And I found out why later. High Times cut off 
the funding. So in retaliation, he ordered a bunch of limousines to take us to the next hotel. And he took the presidential suite in the most expensive hotel in town. He had like half the floor. And uh, I forget where we stayed, but uh, he ordered us up to his room before the show. And oh boy, it took about five minutes to get from the door to his bedroom. And he was lying in bed under a blanket. And he's like, order from room service. We're like, Tom, we just ate. I don't care. Order from room service. So we ordered beer and a meal. And uh, he just started, like, talking about why we're on tour and what we're supposed to do all over again. And one of his instructions is never allow anyone to know that you know me. He, he had been using Roberta's credit card, her American Express, to charge flights and other things to. And she started saying, Tom, I'm worried about my card, you know. And he's like, you want money? Here's some money. And he took this gold bar and threw it at her. He had explained to me earlier he was going to bribe Warner Brothers with gold bars. And Roberta just started crying, and we left shortly afterwards. A very bizarre incident. But Tom was manic depress depressive, and I was too young to understand this stuff. But he was very, uh, he was beyond moody. Tom had hired Andy Cowell to make sure that he did not go manic depressive and bankrupt the company by spending all the money they had on some crazy project. And here Andy's in the position where he is supposed to stop Tom. His job is to stop Tom from killing the magazine. So he's doing what he's told to do. But now Tom's telling him to do something else. And Noel told, uh, told me, he took me aside and said, from here on on the tour, you have total access. We'll give you backstage passes. We'll take care of you. I was like, great. We're going to end the tour on a, on a high note. Tom told me to buy a set of bullhorns to give to Johnny. The Pistols are all having breakfast. And Johnny starts ragging on me. That shit rag of yours, punk, the worst shit in the world. And Paul's saying, come on, John, you give him a break. Don't, don't be like that. And so they left. And I had breakfast, and I went back to my room, and I, I, said, I thought, and thought about the steer horns, and I called Tom. I said, I don't think I'm going to be able to give Johnny Rotten any steer horns. And he said, okay, return him to the gift shop. So I got in the elevator, took him down to the gift shop, and we went down to the next floor, and Johnny and one of his bodyguards steps in. And he says, Cor, what's that? I said, steer horns. And I said, uh, would you like them? And he looks at his bodyguard. The bodyguard's, okay. And I said, and he loved them. And I was like, a little gift from Punk Magazine. And he says, don't forget to slag us off in that magazine of yours. <laughs> so, which is why I think it was kind of a pro wrestling match between New York and London, really. So I called Tom. I'm like, I gave him the steer horns. Well, according to Noel Monk in his book, Seven Days on the Road, they're driving towards uh, L.A., and... The guys, the roadies and Johnny are playing poker or cards. And one of them asks Johnny, where'd you get the steer horns? And he says, oh, from that fool from Punk Magazine. I'm going to give them to my mom. Noel hears that, stops the bus, pulls the steer horns off the bus, chops them up into little pieces. He's convinced that we planted drugs on the Sex Pistols. So that's what happened to the steer horns. It's all very funny because there's been several books that I'm in unauthorized. <clears throat> One written by that stupid ass roadie for Warner Brothers, and uh, you know, saying that all I wanted to do was fuck, fuck, 
I was a star fucker. I wanted to fuck Sid, that and the other. And, you know, I, I had to contact a VA lawyer and tell him to cease and desist the book because, um, <laughs> not okay. Tulsa was when it got rough. That's when the police, the police guy, no, a cop knocked me, kind of knocked me for a loop in Tulsa. He started to grab the camera and I was protective of the camera and I made the mistake of touching his hand and he kind of whacked me. Me, Jones and Cook dived off at Tulsa after the gig. We just fled to the airport. So we didn't take that last journey through the desert to San Francisco. That was Sid on his own and Rob actually we left. And it was at that point, I think, when we were all beginning to uh, not be willing to continue, because Rotten was now being courted by Warner Brothers. He was being separated out. Mal Monk's idea was, and this was a directive from Warner Brothers, was just save Rotten. He's the star. The manager's a fucker. He's a comic. And as for the fucking rest of the crew, they're a waste of space. Just preserve Rotten. So Rotten was then separated from everybody in San Francisco and placed into a, a hotel which none of us knew where he was. But he was being guarded by Monk. And the idea was that Warner Brothers would, at some point, sign Rotten directly and fet him because they thought he was a star and he was the investment worth something rest were a waste of space. And that ultimately was the beginning of the uh, rupture that uh, really wasn't difficult to um, respond to by simply saying, well, that's it, folks. Rotten's in the Beverly Hills. He's going to be uh, dealt with by Warner Brothers. And we're all back. We're all out of here. By the time we got out to San Francisco, we couldn't get in. And I remember Bill Graham personally uh, telling us we couldn't shoot on the streets. And of course, we're allowed to shoot on the streets. And um, I said to him something like, well, who the heck are you? And he says, well, I'm Bill Graham. I said, well, you might be Bill Graham, but we still can shoot on the streets. And, and um, But they blocked us. We couldn't get in. They had our pictures. They knew who we were. And Lick hired I don't know if he hired every freelance uh, news stringer in San Francisco, but he, he hired a bunch of them. And they brought in their news film news cameras, and he gave them all a couple of rolls of film, and they went in with their press credentials and shot the concert. And we actually got the best, <laughs> we got the best coverage of San Francisco. We got to San Francisco. There was this very big show at Winterland, which is a large arena, I guess, five, seven thousand people, something like that in San Francisco. And the band didn't, you know, really belong in that kind of a setting. Uh, I think they were still in more of a club uh, level, you know, because when a band transfers up to a big stage in a big auditorium, it's a different situation. And, and I don't think they were really prepared for that. Although, you know, the performance wasn't horrible. It just wasn't really certainly one of the best ones. Then. The next day, it seemed the band just broke up. For those of us who did see the band and were affected by it, um, it was pretty special experience. Yeah, and meant to be just that. And you couldn't continue it in, in that format because we would have become just another Rolling Stones. And that wasn't what it was about at all. We would have become very safe and very tedious. You know, because you feel pressured into having to be outrageous, and that's not good at all, is it? It's unhealthy. He said, look, I'm not bothered whether we keep Sid or not. I want to carry on the pistols, but I'm not prepared to do it with Malcolm. Now, of course, Steve and Paul were fed up at this point as well. But whereas John had his flat placed in London under his own name, Steve and Paul's flat was in Malcolm's name, as was Sid's place in Maida Vale. So really, they had to toe the line whatever Malcolm wanted or agreed to stay Malcolm because he was paying the wages. After the performance was finished and recording had wrapped um, and we were all to go to an after party um, in the venue um, uh, to celebrate the end of the tour and um, there was a little bit of food and there was some beer and um, 
and everybody that had worked on the tour, everybody on the crew, the people from uh, from from Warner Records, um, the band, everybody was there, and uh, and then the band and Malcolm went off into another room. So the three of them went to, see, went to Malcolm's room, they went in, they had a showdown, John and Malcolm sort of got to it, Steve and Paul left, they waited outside, Rory and Boogie were sort of hovering around in the lobby as well. And then after a few minutes they came out and announced that the band was splitting up, that this had been their final performance. John just came out, said that's it, walked out the door and out of the pistols. I remember the, the people from the record label were not at all happy with uh, the way that, that, this, that this thing transpired. There were a lot of different uh, things pulling them. Nobody had been in a good mood. Some wanted to go with Malcolm. Some didn't want to go with Malcolm. Some were just fed up with the whole thing together. So uh, they just got on different airplanes and went their way. Uh, Sid came to New York, uh, was taken off a plane at Queens Airport. JFK, I guess, in the middle of a blizzard because he was on drugs and I guess he passed out. It all turned out to be exactly the same old thing, so I moved on again. That's when they broke up. And the last thing, the last time we saw Tom in San Francisco, he asked us if we want to go to Brazil because he was all set to go down to Brazil. That's when uh, Malcolm, Paul, and Steve went down to Brazil to record with the great train robbery uh, robber, uh, Ronald Biggs. I guess he's famous in England. The story that was selling in the English newspapers was Sex Pistols Tour. So you had all these press from Washington who had never been on the rock and roll tour, didn't even know what the fuck it was. They were typical lushers meaning they drank in bars, they didn't even go to the concerts, they were in, Memphis, in San Antonio, they were just sitting in the bar and wanted to know what was happening, how did it go? And, and if they gave me 30,000 pounds, one newspaper, English newspaper, if uh, we would just fly to Rio, directly out of San Francisco, to take a picture with England's most wanted train robber, Ronnie Biggs. Okay? <laughs> And we did it simply because the next leg of the tour, Italy, we were banned, and then Finland, the government banned us from entering Finland. And all our European crew, our European road managers, were trapped now on the borders of Finland and Stockholm with the gear. And we thought, oh, fuck it, let's just go to Rio. It's sunshine and we'll meet Ronnie Biggs. He's cool. And we got 30 grand to spend on a fabulous holiday. <laughs> so we, so and I remember Warner Bros. saying to us, well, what are you going to Rio for? You're going to, you, you get, you won't leave Rio. Now, I remember this guy, Bob Regeer, saying, you'll never get out of Rio alive. But Rotten didn't show up. And he didn't show up for the fact that Warner Brothers were now fating him. He was on a little garden tour of the Beverly Hills. They were showing him where Paul Simon might be living. Or they were showing him where Neil Simon might be living. Or they were showing him some bollocks and saying, you too can live next door. And uh, I think he was persuaded to be a, a, a star for Warner Brothers. And that really was the end. That's how it all started to fall apart. And we went to Rio without uh, Rotten. And Sid, of course, in San Francisco, once the vets took the handcuffs off, Sid OD in Hay Ashbury. The first step towards finishing this painting, finishing this saga, uh, by making the Great Rock and Roll Swindle, and that name came out of the Great Train Robbery. And we thought the Great Rock and Roll Swindle, and we started to film Ronnie Biggs with the idea of, why don't we just throw Ronnie Biggs in the fucking band? Just, just record another song with Ronnie. So, so I said, yeah, we'll get Ronnie as the lead singer. Of course, Warner Brothers. Now the Sex Pistols have got a new recruit. England's most wanted train robber was now the lead singer of the Sex Pistols and uh, that was intolerable obviously for all parties concerned um, but we thought it was the right step in the right direction and uh, began the movie The Great Rock and Roll Swindle there and that was the end of rock really. The Pistols began to be corrupted by believing their own press and that wasn't good it had to stop. Johnny uh, 
left the band and he went to New York and he stayed with Joe Stevens. And uh, this is ironic because we went to CBGB's and they were filming a movie with Richard Hell. They had like that, those railroad tracks you run for a tracking shot. The film is The Blank Generation, directed by Uli Lamo. And if you watch the scene where Richard plays Blank Generation at CBGB's, as the camera pans, you can see Johnny Rotten's tartan jacket. And you can see him sitting next to Cheetah Chrome. And then the camera moves to the stage and Richard sings. I thought that was a great piece of irony to end the uh, tour with. But it's the business side of it, and it does creep in, tends to destroy all of that. We broke up because it just it was pointless to carry on. Uh, <laughs> polite in Arab territories. This is the T-shirt that they gave, I guess, everybody on the tour. Um, I survived, and then the Sex Pistols' first American tour. Uh, I think somebody took the, you know, this, and then they wrote, but the band didn't. I survived, but the band didn't. But I chose not to mark my shirt up <clears throat> so I can sell it for $1 million. I will take $100,000 for this shirt. It's a size small, never been worn, only tried on. Yeah, yeah, I never got home. I never went home. I never got back to my house till the tour was over. I needed to do some packing and get ready to fly back to Texas the next day. And um, the bell rang on my, uh, there was a knock at my hotel door. And I go and open up the door and there is Lack. We're going to the UK, we're going to London um, right away to, uh, um, to continue working on the documentary. And, um, and I wondered if, you were doing anything, and if you would, uh, if you'd like to come along, and uh, okay, what do you want me to do? And he said, I don't know yet, but we'd like for you to be on the crew. I said, uh, you know, okay, I've got to go back to Texas. I have a flight. I, you know, the ticket booked. And he said, you go back there. In the meantime, we're going to go to London and we will have a ticket booked for you to go to London and then you join us just as soon as you can. And um, well, okay. And I flew back to Texas, you know, found my passport, um, did my laundry, threw some stuff in a bag, and um, off I went. Sid went back to New York. I think he OD'd on the plane and he ended up in the hospital. And he was very lonely. There was a blizzard, so nobody could really travel. I know I ended up with all the film, and I must have gone back to Atlanta, and I must have slept for a couple of days. But I know I had all the film, yes. And then I flew the film up to New York. And I hit New York, it still hadn't been processed. And I had these two big boxes of, of uh, 16 millimeter film. And there was this epic blizzard. And so I walked across New York City because I said, oh, I was on 55th Street, the lab. But it was 55th and 10th, and I was on 55th and 2nd, and I didn't know New York. So I ended up walking across this three feet of snow with the film. And by the time I got there, the cardboard boxes were disintegrated. And uh, so we were in New York, and we processed the film. And then at a certain point, and I don't know when it was, we went to England. And I don't remember whether I ever went back to Atlanta or I stayed in New York and then went to England. And that's when we, we filmed, you know, a lot of the, what you see in DOA is what we shot roaming around London. And the, the interview with Sid and Nancy was shot in their apartment. I was not privy to the meetings, but they decided to go to England because they did not get enough footage to make a Sex Pistols documentary. As far as I remember, Lech Kowalski <clears throat> had taken it on himself to go around following the Pistols on their American tour. It turned out to be their last tour, and suddenly his footage was valuable. And that was why he'd come to London to get extra footage to bolster and to document the scene. The London shoot 
it was a documentary. It was a documentary about punk rock. It was a documentary about music. It was happening in London. You know, the, the, you know, the place. I had a friend called Variety who knew Let Kowalski and she lived in New York and she put him in touch with me and said I lived in the center, epicenter of punctum and therefore could I show him around. I couldn't believe it, I was very excited because I'd just been a secretary before and this was my first job on a film. And so I was very excited to be involved. I got £400 a week, I think. The punk scene happened on the King's Road. There were people posing for photographs for a living who'd made the worst of themselves, looking really hideous. Because the young, of course, are very suggestible. And I have a number of friends who were punks for a brief period, just because if you were a certain age in 1978, was it? then you were a punk just because it was expected of you. No, I ain't got no friends, nobody. I want friends. It's not a fake band, that's a real band. Terry and the Idiots were a real punk band. Terry and the Idiots was a bit of an oddity, but I understood what Leck was trying to do. He was trying to, he was, you know, the, the, Terry was kind of like very, Low life, lower class, not necessarily low life, I shouldn't say that. He was, he was kind of very lower class, very working class. Uh, he seemed to be an arch archetypal fodder to become a punk. He sort of was a little bit. Um, but, and I thought it was not a bad idea to have him kind of as a sort of, you know, as, as an archetype of the other side of you know, what the Pistols, what, which, you know, which was kind of, they're already a mega group. So I thought it was not a bad idea. At first I was a bit wary. I thought, oh no, I see what you're doing here. And I thought it worked, because actually, you know, he's probably the only lengthy kind of actual, you know, working class kid in the film, really. There's no one else. I mean, there's, you know, the Sid for whatever, whatever, you know, the, the star names, but there's no one else, really. And he kind of, he acts as a kind of fulcrum. He gives the film a bit of sense, actually. Especially, you know, the grim spectres of where he's living. It's really nasty where he's living. Terry and the Idiots were a real band. They were just a real bad band. But that's what the scene was like back then. All these kids started bands. Oh, the blonde Billy Idol. I met him one night. He was charming. Having fun. Yeah, we, me and my friends, uh, as they are Susan the Banshees and people in London, we decided that we were going to create our own entertainment. We didn't even think about record companies making records. We just thought, we want to make music, that's our way of entertaining ourselves. We want to start our own clubs, and that's what Generation X did. We started the Roxy in England, and we were also a group. So um, I think we did, we did what we wanted, and then suddenly all these record companies came fawning around, and. Uh, Chris Lewis offered the most money, so but he took the money and ran. Well, now well, the, the one thing about um, punk rock was this the sort of chaotic idea of it was brilliant, but it also meant that that sometimes a lot of the sort of ideas, the messages in it, were lost because um, they they was it wasn't always capable of of driving its message home. You know, like uh, the the people's ability to play wasn't always what they were thinking. You know, in other words, what your mind was saying, your hands weren't necessarily um, showing on. Billy Idol is one of the only people who really became successful from punk rock, which I liked. Uh, I love that first Generation X album. I think it's one of the best punk rock albums. Uh, great guitar solos, <laughs> ironically. Um, but uh, to me, he was like the punk Elvis in a way. He stole that mantle from Sid because he had a sex appeal. And punk was notoriously anti-sex. And then I saw that nice girl, Polly Styrene. She was quite charming. Who was it who sang, Oh, Bondage Up Yours? She was really quite sweet.
Glenn Matlock, yeah, he definitely didn't fit into the Sex Pistols, even though he created all the music. But he was like a nice guy and smart. And uh, I actually got to meet him several times over the last few years. Uh, he's uh, he's an he has eclectic tastes. He, you know, Pretty Vacant was based on an ABBA song. He took the riff from ABBA. Glenn didn't fit into the band because he didn't dress punk or act punk enough, from what I understand. And uh, John, Johnny Rotten wanted Sid in the band. Sid was more of a punk. The Rich Kids had, uh, had been all over the, the music media uh, as the saviors of rock and roll, and they'd never released anything. Um, somebody put two and two together and came up with 50. Uh, they had three members, and they were looking for the elusive fourth member. And Mick Jones had stood in for a while, and I think they maybe tried a couple of other people. And again, it was Caroline Coon, the same journalist who had uh, kind of fallen in love with Slick and coined the, you know, punk rock town. Uh, she said to Glenn, she'd check this guy out from, from Slick, because uh, he's good, he can play. And out of all the people that Glenn could have had, you know, the cool people that might have made the, the rich kids, you know, work uh, in the long term, um, he, he followed that through and, and approached me. I didn't realise it was in it until you told me. Hey, it was punk. <laughs> it, it really was baptism by fire. I came down, I did the rehearsals, and then I went back to Glasgow, and I, and I kind of thought, I'm not sure. I really wasn't sure. Um, you know, although I, I think I was just clinging on to my roots and my family and all of the things that I had in Scotland. Uh, and I finally made the decision, no, it's, it's time. I need to move on. I need to go and do something else. And I uh, came down and joined the Rich Kids, who, who happened to be a much better band than I ever hoped they, they would be. Uh, you know, we ended up uh, making one album produced by the brilliant Mick Ronson. Uh, unfortunately, I bought a synthesizer and that broke the band in two. I brought a synthesizer, wanted to incorporate electronics with this rock setup. And uh, Glenn and Steve New, the guitarist, absolutely hated it. And Rusty Egan and myself absolutely loved it. So it, it just split the band after a year. I don't think the rich kids actually did fit into the music scene. You know, the, the, the media called us power pop, which is just hideous. And it's a horrible term. You know, most terms that the journalist coin are pretty bad. Yeah, it, it, we kind of fell on stony ground. Uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't really fit uh, anywhere. There was us and there was Elvis Costello and maybe even the Boomtown Rats because they were a bit too musical to be punk as well. Uh, and we were the ones all kind of earmarked to, to do something long term, to do something mainly in America. Uh, and of course it just never happened. It never happened for the Boomtown Rats, but it happened for Elvis. Because we had this, this weird hybrid of an audience. We had some of the people who used to go and see Slick and some of the people who used to go and see the Pistols. And they just came from, you know, the opposite ends of the, the planet. So it was a really strange time. It was very odd. You know, I, I remember playing in Newcastle, which is up in the north of England, the northeast of England, and just about as north as you can get without going into Scotland. And uh, we got through th the first song and a bottle smashed off the end of my, my guitar and I went off and then was talked back on again. This time the guy had better aim, he got me right in the face, split my head open and I ended up in a, in a, in a hospital with my head stitched. And it was kind of like that, it was just madness, you know. And fucking think, oh, he don't mean it. He's, he's only doing it because uh, it makes him a lot bigger, you know what I mean? I don't want to fucking keep saying, stop fighting, stop fighting. Just fucking enjoy yourselves for a change. Jimmy Percy of Sham 69 was a really great performer. Unfortunately, I never got to see them. They didn't tour America. But when you see the film, when you see that scene in the film, they were getting hassled. They were attracting a lot of National Front people, and that was the, the neo-Nazis. 
And they didn't want the Nazis uh, following them. They were anti-Nazi. So that explains that scene a little more. Oh yes, I went, when I worked on this film, I went to um, gigs with the team and I stood looking disdainfully on and slightly frightened because there was often violence at the gigs. Chris Salovitz, very sort of um, angry about the fact that what he saw as a proper social revolution was gradually being sort of neutered by media sort of um, acceptance of it rather than ignoring of it, and he called it a corporate bland out, which uh, was a phrase that Leck was very keen on. Corporate bland out, man, that's exactly what it is. And it all seemed so unhealthy. I mean, some of it was quite exciting, like The Clash and people like that. But Kings Road became like a tourist destination because people could take photos of these freaks and send them back to all points of the globe. I did get some of the money to start with, but then what happened after a few weeks, the um, producer, Carl, said that they were in trouble because the um, man who owned High Times, who was funding it, had either gone missing or was ill, and although the money obviously would come, it wasn't going to come in time for them to achieve what they wanted while they were in London. And I don't know how or why I agreed, she let them use my credit card, but I paid for everything for a couple of weeks. I suppose that's the way cheapskate film producers get their footage, by tricking people who were flattered to be involved in the first place. Later in London, we, we had a long, long, long interview with Sid and Nancy. Sid and Nancy were just... Well, I suppose for their own safety, they should have been locked up till they got a bit older. Favorite experience and a and you know and a biggest disaster uh, kind of all fold into one thing, and that was the interview with Sid and Nancy, which um, you know we had been out having you know a full day of shooting, and then I believe a call comes in to Chris Selovich um, that you know Sid is back from you know being in hospital in New York and. And he and Nancy want to talk about the breakup of the band, and uh, and so, you know, Chris, as I understand it, says, you know, I can come, but I'm bringing a film crew, and they were like, oh, okay, fine, bring a film crew. We get to their flat, and there's bottle, pill bottles, and medicine bottles, and and uh, you know, all sorts of stuff, you know, all over the floor and all over the bed, and Nancy is, you know, explaining, well, you know, he's been, Sid's been sick, he's been very ill, and so he's got to take a lot of medicine. And she said, he's taken Dilaudid, and he is, uh, we've had a bottle of codeine cough syrup, and, um, and smoked a few spliffs, and here's some pain pills, and, um, but the general feeling was they had probably also hit up a bunch of smack. I mean, there was an electricity in that room, because we had no idea what was going to happen. And Sid was, you know, semi-conscious, um, is probably the, the highest point that he reached was semi-conscious uh, during the entire uh, interview, and most of the time he was just out. Not, not everyone involved in, in the production seemed to be as taken with the values of punk as, as, as I assumed everyone was. For example, the producer, when we told him what had happened at the Sid and Nancy interview, said, I'd have just walked out. I've just left him to have just walked out. What do you stay for? What do you want to do all that stuff for? Sid? Ow! Sid, damn you! I fell asleep, didn't I? I fell asleep, yeah. Which is in the film. Yeah, that was an all-night interview. Well, Sid is in the uh, Chelsea Hotel. Yeah. With Nancy, and Nancy is found stabbed to death. Did Sid do it? The kind of feeling is that he probably did. Someone said to me, who knew them very well, said, punk rock, mate. Punk rock, playing around with knives. 
but there's lots of kind of conspiracy theories you know that it was dumb you know dealer did it or whoever you know but of course it's absolutely i mean it's it's the scene that we witnessed of domestic hell in that maid of ale muse cottage was just it had just taken a quantum leap that was this i think that was the same thing we saw but something else happened there's an add-on and it went wrong i think that's someone who knew who who, who kind of looked after sid a bit in new york told me that that's what sid had told him i'm sorry they were just fooling around with knives i don't know it's so just I don't know, that's, that's, it seemed to make sense. Over the summer, Tom tried to show a rough cut to um, Robert Evans, the Godfather producer. Victor Bacher set up the meeting. Tom got in because he could score the best pharmaceutical cocaine, and so they screened the movie. But Evans is like, who cares about a movie about a band that broke up six months ago? But can you get me more coke? People didn't trust Tom because he would disappear for long periods of time. But he didn't want people to know he was a drug smuggler. So in November, Tom was getting more and more depressed. November 78, Jack Combs died flying in a plane load of pot for Tom. And I think Tom was responsible in a large way because uh, he was radioing instructions from the ground. And Tom had to watch the plane crash, his best friend die, and the entire plane load of pot to burn up. I would, when I would see Tom from that point on, you could cut the depression with a knife. It was tough. Jack wasn't there to pull him out of it, and Tom suffered from seasonal adjustment disorder, so the days were getting shorter, there was less sun, he was doing quaaludes. I had found a business manager for punk, this guy Spacely, and I figured he would be the perfect guy for, for uh, punk and for Tom. He had been a member of the STP family, and he had been a real hippie, but he was into punk. There are two hippie punks who could get along. And I called Tom, and uh, I said, hey, let's meet. He's like, very depressed, okay, just set up a meeting with Maureen. And then two days later, I was at CBS Records dropping off some artwork for uh, some work I'd done for them, and the news came over the radio that Tom had killed himself. And it was terrible. That threw the high times into chaos. I remember going to the press conference, people were grieving all over the place. There was a memorial at windows on the world at the World Trade Center and people were accusing me of killing Tom because you got him into punk rock and punk killed Tom it was that movie that killed Tom the Sex Pistols killed Tom so I heard from as I remember around January Leck had me come up to this uh, editing room at the Film Center building I don't know if it's still there. It's on 9th Avenue around 43rd, 44th Street. And he, he wanted to show me the rough cut, and he wanted my feedback. Uh, they knew I was close to Tom. I had been on the tour. I, was, I knew about punk. So I became like an unpaid consultant. But they were going to have me do the graphics for the film, so I would get paid something. From then on, I was kind of inside the process. It all, it all came out well. But there's another aspect to it, and I'm lucky to have any credit on the film at all, uh, based, on, based on what happened later. Lech, and, Lech Kowalski, the director, and Val Kuklowski just were hysterically laughing because they had no idea how the bills were getting paid. I think High Times was in such turmoil that they couldn't keep track of the expenses, which were really piling up. 
because Leck and Val were in there every day editing and editing. I think the film ratio was 35 to 1 or some ridiculous amount. They'd show me a version of the film, I'd give them my feedback. Uh, I started working on the graphics for the film. Uh, I painted the, the glass panes for the title card, DOA. And one day we went to some basement downtown. Leck pulled out a 22 and we set up the glass panes and he shot with a 22. But it was quite a distance. And as you can see, it takes a while. <laughs> it takes a lot of bullets for him to shoot out the glass. Leck set up about three separate screenings and re-edited the film drastically each time. They ran out of money and High Times refused to back the film. So they brought in a producer named Tom Norman and he bought the, the rights for the next eight years. From then on, High Times was not directly involved and Tom forewalled it for its premiere at the Waverly Theater in April 1981. Lech I think was working on the film to the very last minute when he brought the film to the initial screening for the premiere, which was sold out with a very rowdy crowd. The film was so dirty, you could barely even see parts of it. He, was, he brought in the work print. So the, the crowd reacted very badly at so many parts of the movie. Oh, screaming, yelling, throwing stuff at the screen. It was a, a, fitting, a fitting premiere. I haven't seen the film for a long time, but I think certainly the performance uh, footage holds up, and luckily they shot it because, you know, that would have been a big um, Im omission for the punk movement if we didn't have any footage or really good footage of the Pistols playing because, you know, they were quite, quite the band. <laughs> Punk was having another revival by 81. It kind of died in 79, but in, then once Blondie brought out Heart of Glass, the disco started going new wave. And by 81, I was going to discos and they're playing Sex Pistols my way. And people would pogo at discos to the Sex Pistols. It was a crazy time. The timing of the release of DOA was perfect for that. It played to Waverly, it finished its run and did not make money, it lost money there. Tom Norman would bring it on a road show. He'd play it in rock clubs and kind of charge it as if he was a rock band. And he got pretty big crowds. After the road show, I don't think much happened with the movie. Leck would screen it occasionally, but, you know, High Times was just going slowly downhill, both as the war on drugs took its toll and staff members got into cocaine. It was a mess. But the, the problems began when Larry Flint was shot, because Flint was distributing High Times. And that was causing some financial problems in his empire. I think High Times came back in 86. That's when they hired Steve Hager to be the editor. And he said, no more cocaine. So they adopted that policy. And he hired me. And I would not come to the magazine if they were uh, pushing cocaine or hard drugs. And he brought the whole you know, activism back. He brought back a sense of fun, good journalism. The, the original High Times formula, which had gotten lost. We were almost closed down by the government in 88. Uh, it was very controversial to be in favor of marijuana back then. And then a few years later, Cypress Hill wanted to be in the magazine. And they became the official rap group for normal. And, and it just kind of snowballed. And the sales started getting better and better. Lech Kowalski contacted me and said, John, High Times owns DOA now. You should try to release it. So we worked with Lech to try to get things moving again. There was no paperwork to be signed. The copyright was in High Times' name. When we tried to release it on DVD in England, the Sex Pistols threatened to sue us for a million dollars because we did not have their permission. The film had their permission 
when they broke up, the band went into receivership. They went into bankruptcy, and the bankruptcy court gave the film permission to use it. But then the band had a meeting, and the band kicked Malcolm out and decided to take back all their rights. So there was friction between the two parties from that point on. But then ironically, in the late 90s, I went to a screening for Filth and the Fury, and they were using scenes from DOA. So our lawyers contacted their lawyers, and they gave High Times permission to use everything Sex Pistols related. I think DOA is the best film made about punk rock in the late 1970s. It really is not a great movie, but it's a very good movie. It has some great performances. And uh, what else is there, really? You have some music videos, you have film here and there, but there's no feature film that covers so much ground. That's a reason why I'm so glad that this movie has been re released at last. Because this is a big part of Tom's legacy. He died to make this. Everything has to end. Punk had to come to an end because everything that everyone stood for, you know, bringing down the dinosaurs, you know, bringing down the big bands that were generating huge sums, the bands who started that movement started demanding big sums. They became the big bands. They became the, the very thing they were trying to eliminate. And that's just human nature. You know, the record company, record business is very entrenched and has, you know, all the ways that they did things and, you know, they didn't, they would have preferred never to change, I suppose, but little by little, I guess they did, to the point where there's no record companies anymore. So the whole world changed, but it, it took a very, very long time. It's difficult for me to say what the legacy of punk rock would be, but I, I think it was the last cultural grassroots movement, really. Punk rock happened just a short time before the home computer came along. And so it was the last analog culture. Uh, things started going digital, and that's changed the landscape. Things, art and music and culture are so easy to produce and reproduce now. It's changed the way everybody thinks and the way we do things. So to me, that punk is kind of the apex of analog DIY. The DIY was really started by punk, and that's do it yourself. And that's, that means you don't need a big corporation to steal your idea. You can do it yourself, distribute it yourself, and make all the money directly. Well, I suppose it's fed into that thing that anyone can perform, whether they're any good or not. I think the attitude that punk always had, that it didn't matter if you could play or not, it didn't matter if you had the, the right criteria or the right equipment or the right facilities, you, 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 if you had the attitude and you had the drive to do it, you could go out there and do this. And you can see that at CBGB's too. The no, whole no wave movement was like people who really could not play their instruments releasing records. You know, success brings you finances. It brings you a nice house, it brings you a nice car. All of a sudden, your ideals are compromised.
you know, the the idea of going out there and pulling down, you know, Yes or Led Zeppelin or Pink Floyd or whatever, because they were the dinosaurs of rock, you know, within two years of punk happening, you know, The Clash were playing big gigs. The Pistols have been out recently, uh, you know, doing a, a Reformation tour and were paid millions of dollars to go out and do these, these, uh, these huge open air shows. Um, so it, it has to change and you have to become kind of what it is because that's the only mould there is. You think you're breaking a mould when you're 20 and by the time you're 40 you're squeezing out of the mould because you don't, you don't quite fit it anymore. Some people that might never have made it, so to speak, if they hadn't been emboldened by the examples of punk. Un unfortunately, that's how it happens. You know, the, you know, the best ideals in the world. You know, we all we all wanted to change the world when we were teenagers. You know, but by the time you're 35, you're part of the world that you wanted to change. I saw something interesting where the uh, the New York blackout started to rap because uh, those riots enabled everybody to get a stereo. But I I think. Punk had an obvious influence on rap. The first big hit rap record was by Blondie. And in 1977, Chris Stein of Blondie went to England and he said, John, you should move to London and publish your magazine there. The scene is unbelievable. In 1979, Chris Stein said, John, you should go up to the South Bronx and start a new magazine about this rap scene. It's going to be huge. Chris is a very smart guy. So Blondie had a lot to do with giving exposure to the rap scene. And I think our DIY ethic helped them. And I think also the sound. I think rap music was influenced by the, the loud and fast virtues of punk rock by the time Run DMC recorded with Aerosmith. You know, I met Steven Tyler once and he said, you know, we were called punk rock when we brought out our first album. And, and that's the thing about punk. Often that's what you sound like when you put out your first record because you don't know what you're doing yet, but you want to do it. I think that, that Leck was able to build a story that has a, you know, it's not just about music. It's not just about punk as the latest thing. It's not just about the personalities of the musicians. It's about the society, the sociological, you know, entity that created punk, about the attitudes, the attitudes of the people on, 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 on the side of people who liked punk and on the side of the people who detested punk. And I find it very odd now when I see Johnny Rotten on telly because it seems like one of those people who shouldn't have grown old, who should have just stayed that age that he was. doesn't really suit being old. I don't hang in the past. It doesn't bother me as much as it does quite a few people and usually the people that weren't around in those days anyway, as you know. Being in the excitement of all of it was, was you know, I mean, that was an unforgettable experience, a truly unforgettable experience. The punk rock isn't the sort of thing that's meant to last, not certainly as those groups. And I think it goes to show that, um, that most, quite a lot of those people are still doing things and valid things and even better things. I think public image, in a way, uh, were a lot more interesting than Sex Pistols. And punk rock gave, we had the power, they came to us. And they still come to me. I've never, I've never had to beg. <laughs>